to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ of the life of jesus christ the people in his day said and they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Mark chapter 7, verse number 37. We welcome you today to our study of the Gospel of Mark. Mark is going to identify the majesty, the magnificence, and the power of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. We're so glad that you joined us for our study today. We want to make sure that you have your Bible handy as we're going to look to the Word of God as our final guide and only authority in all matters. As always, today's lessons are being brought to you by members and congregations of the Lord's Church. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly on Sunday or Wednesday. They'd be happy to have you. You'd be an honored guest anytime there. If you'd like to learn more about the church or the plan of salvation or Christian living, why well, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you and look to the Scriptures together to learn about Christ. At the Gospel of Christ, We'd also like to help you in your study and your journey to know God and His Word better. Check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a wide array of biblical material, video, audio, written material, and it's all free. You can access it 24-7 on the web. It's all free. We'd love for you to check that out. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, you can download that from our website, or if you'd like to have a hard copy in DVD or CD form, We'd be happy to send that to you free of charge. Just log on to our website, fill out a free media request form, and we'll put that in the mail to you free of charge. We're thinking about the Gospel of Mark today, and Mark is one of the more exciting, one of the more powerful and active Gospel accounts that we have. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all a little bit unique. Matthew is a Jew writing to Jews about the greatest Jew to ever live, Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Luke is writing to a Gentile audience, a Greek audience, and he's writing about the perfection of Christ, uh, showing that he's perfect in every way. John is writing to a generic audience about the deity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and Mark Mark Anthony, believed to be a kind of a Mark being a Roman name, Mark is a Roman writing to the Romans about the powerful actions and deeds of Jesus Christ. As you're well aware probably, the Romans were a, a military-minded, action-minded people. And Mark focuses less on what Jesus said and more on what Jesus did. The word straightway, or immediately, or the King James will have it anon, occurs some 52 times in this book. We'll be hearing about something Jesus did, and immediately he changed and did this or that, showing Jesus as active, just like the Roman mind was engaged in. Thus, Mark emphasizes the power and the majesty of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we mentioned, Mark 7, verse 37, kind of, is a summary statement of the great life of Jesus and very likely one of the key verses in Mark. The Bible says again, they were astonished beyond measure. The people were astonished beyond measure saying, He, Jesus, has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Isn't that a great statement about the life of Jesus in general? Christ has done all things things well. The perfection, the majesty, the power, the, the climax of the Lord's life 
is seen in Mark chapter 7, verse number 37. And so we want to look today in chapters 1 through 4, and then we'll continue our study in the Gospel of Mark over the next several weeks. But Mark begins in Mark 1, verse 1 by saying, The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Friend, we're introduced to Jesus and His majesty by recognizing that He is the Son of God. The deity of Jesus is going to be clearly seen throughout the Gospel of Mark and His power is seen as well. He is God in the flesh. Matthew chapter 1 uh, verses 19 through 21 and thus He is so powerful, He is so magnificent because He is the Son of God, thus God Himself. We begin the ministry of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, like with various other accounts of the Gospel of Christ as well, by seeing Jesus' baptism and the beginning of His ministry. Well, let's think for just a moment then about the baptism of Jesus. A lot of people want to think of Jesus, and rightly so, as our ultimate premier example, 1 Peter 2, verse 19 through 21, we're to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And thus, a lot of people will ask the question, what would Jesus do? And rightly so. But as it relates to the baptism of Jesus and baptism in general, what would Jesus do? What was Jesus' baptism like? Am I to emulate that example? Well, let's look and see in Mark chapter 1. I want you to read with me, beginning in verse number 9. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Now listen to this. And immediately coming up from or out of the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven saying, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so we know that Jesus, according to Matthew, was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. But Christians are also commanded, God's people today are commanded to be baptized as well. Well, how was Jesus baptized? By what mode? Was our Lord baptized? You know, when we think about baptism, in the world in which we live in today, people often say, well, baptism can be sprinkling, it can be pouring a little water on somebody, or it can be immersion. Any three of those is just fine. Well, friend, we want to ask the question, what did Jesus do concerning the mode of baptism? And here's what we know from Mark chapter 1, verse 10. Coming up out of the water, the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. Now here's the question we've got to consider. To come, literally, to come up ek, or out of the water, what do you first have to do? Well, friend, you've got to go down into the water. And so when we think about the mode of Jesus' baptism, Jesus didn't have a little water sprinkled on him or a little water poured on him. Jesus was literally enveloped, encased in the water, and he came up out of that. And so that's a clear picture of the biblical mode of baptism as immersion. And friend, that's not the only example we find. In the Gospel of John, we find more about uh, John's baptizing. In John 3, verse 23, John was baptizing in the region of Anon near Salim because there was much water there. How much water does it take to sprinkle? Not much. How much to pour? Not much. How much water does it take to immerse an adult? much water. John chapter 3 verse 23. But probably the clearest picture of baptism and the mode of it is found in Romans 6 verses 1 through 4. Here we are told that baptism is a burial in which we contact the death and the blood of Jesus. Now friend, the picture there of baptism being a burial is going to go hand in hand and not contradict the mode of baptism, right? Well, what is a burial? A burial, if you remember, last time you went to a, a funeral and they went to the graveside, they dug a hole in the ground, they placed that body in the grave, it's covered on the bottom, it's covered on every side by dirt. They placed that body in that grave and they completely covered it. It is engulfed, encased, or immersed 
in the ground. Thus, a burial is a clear picture of the mode of baptism as well being immersion. And so when we ask the question, what would Jesus do as it relates to baptism? He was baptized and he was immersed in water to fulfill all righteousness. Now, as Jesus begins his ministry by being baptized, we're now going to see the mission Jesus is going to give to some of his followers and that mission by application applying to all Christians as well today. I want you to notice Mark chapter 1, what the Bible says in verse number 17 with me. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. And so Jesus is talking to some of the immediate disciples, Peter, Andrew, John, some of those, and they were followers of John, and now they realize John said this is the one we need to be looking for. And Jesus says, follow me. You won't be fishers of men, and you won't be fishers of fish anymore. If you follow me, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And so when we think about Christianity and our mission, the mission that Christ gave us, we are to help people see the gospel of Jesus Christ and to spread the message of our Lord. You remember Jesus' words in Matthew 28, 18, Go into all the world, preach the gospel unto every creature. Mark 16, verse 15, uh, as well as Matthew 28, 18, we're to take the gospel to all nations. We are to proclaim the praises of Him who called us out of darkness, 1 Peter 2, verse 9. And so, uh, while these men had spent their livelihood catching fish, Jesus says, now I want you to take the gospel and catch men. You're going to be fishers of men by teaching them the word of our God. And friend, what a privilege. That is for every Christian to be able to share the love, the mercy, the grace, and the saving message of Jesus Christ with others. How wonderful it is to be a follower of Christ and a fisher of men. Then as Jesus' ministry continues on, He is now going to impress upon both His disciples and the people who hear Him, His authority and His power. I want you to look in Mark 1 verse 22 and notice what happens next. After Jesus had healed and taught on the Sabbath, the Bible says in verse 22, and they were astonished at His teaching, for He taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Unlike the scribes who might say, um, teacher said this or the law might say this or the prophet or one interpretation. No, Jesus didn't say might, maybe, probably. One group believes this, one group believes Jesus said, here's the way it is. God's Word says this and we stand behind it. Jesus taught them not as the scribes who were legal analyzers and looked at as legal analyzers and interpreters as it were, Jesus taught them with authority. This is what God says. You have heard that it was said of old, but I say to you, Jesus will say that multiple times in the Sermon on the Mount. And so what He's trying to get across and, and what it impresses upon our heart and mind is the Lord has absolute and final authority, and whatever He says, that's the final word on the matter. Friend, isn't that a great attitude to have? Matthew 28, 18, All authority, Jesus said, has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Friend, let's make application to that. If Jesus, if people saw His authority in the first century, and if the Bible says Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. Well, how much authority does that leave for anybody else? Can you have more than all? No. Jesus has absolute and final authority and that uh, His Word and His teaching is found in the Bible, which is our authority. Uh, the Scripture says in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, and in Colossians 1, verses 15 through 18, that Christ is the head of the church. He's over all things, that in all things He might have the preeminence. 
A friend of Christ is head of the church. Why do we need somebody else to do that? We don't need a, a human figure to be the head. The church is not decapitated. Christ is still the head. He still has all authority. And whatever the Lord says, not men, not polls, not other people's ideas or commentaries, what matters is, is there any word from the Lord? Jeremiah 37, 17. And what does the Scripture say? Romans chapter 4, verse number 3. Now, as part of the life of Jesus that is so powerful and so compelling, we see the Lord gets a good start to every day by beginning it with prayer. We want to follow the model of Jesus. Let's follow Him in prayer. Look in Mark chapter 1, and I want you to see what the Lord did to begin His day. In verse number 35, the Scripture records this. Now, in the morning having risen a great while or a long while before daylight, Jesus went out, departed to a solitary place, and there He prayed. In the morning, that is, Jesus made a, an intent and a purpose to start every day with prayer. In the morning, a great while before daylight. He even got up early, as it were. Maybe set His alarm clock, if we can use that like got up early. He went to a solitary place. He got away from the hustle and the bustle and the distractions of this world, and He prayed. You know, we think about the power of Jesus. We think about the good He did in such a short amount of time. We think about His marvelous example, and we're in awe of that, and rightly so. But let's realize as well, Jesus knew where help would come from. Jesus knew to get every day started right. God was the source of strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me today. Philippians 4.13 And with God, nothing is impossible. The end of Luke chapter 1 clearly teaches us. And so like Christ, let's utilize the power of prayer. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails or overcomes much. James 5 verse 16 And thus the Hebrew writer would say in Hebrews 4 verse 16 Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find grace and mercy to help in our time of need. Let's use Jesus as the example as well in prayer and really let God help us by getting our day off to the right start with prayer to God and no doubt encouraging us as well. When we turn to Mark chapter 2, we're then going to see Jesus advancing His mission and His ministry. And as Jesus is discussing with the people of His day His power and their need to look to Him as the great teacher, we also see that part of that power is Jesus' ability to forgive sins. Look in Mark chapter 2, and I want you to notice what's said in verse number 10. The Bible records this in Mark 2 verse 10. Jesus said, But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And so, You've got this great scene of this man who's let down through the roof. He's a paralytic. His friends let him down. Jesus says to the man, Take up your bed, sin no more, go your way. And uh, he got up and walked. And what a great miracle that was. But the people sitting around said, Why did he say, Your sins are forgiven? And so they're reasoning in their hearts, and Jesus knows that. And he said, So that you would realize the Son of Man has that power, I said to him, your sins are forgiven you. And so we learn about Christ that He has the power to forgive sins. Now, as you will read the Gospel account, uh, they'll reason in their hearts later, hey, there's something going on here. Only God has the power to forgive sins. Jesus said, your sins are forgiven you. Therefore, they're going to put two and two together and say, wait a minute, He's claiming to be God, which, friend, is exactly the point. John 10 verse 10, I and the Father are one. Jesus is Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And so when we think about Christ's power to forgive sins, who that makes Christ and His overall power, friend, we realize Christ is divine. Christ 
is God because only God can forgive sin and Jesus did that and claimed that. And thus when we see his miracles, when we hear his teaching, when we see him uh, do great things, when we see him eventually ascend back to the Father, we're reminded of the wonderful power of Christ because he is God, he is divine, he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings as Revelation chapter 19 teaches us. But not only is Christ divine and does he have the power to forgive sins, but Mark's going to teach us as well that Jesus is that, that wonderful great physician and healer, not only physically, but spiritually as well. Jesus is the great physician. Look in Mark chapter 2 at what the scripture says in verse number 17. Jesus is there wondering how can Jesus eat with tax collectors and sinners. When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus used a, a really clever illustration here. He basically says, if you think you're all right, you don't go to the doctor. If I'm feeling, if I wake up and I'm feeling great, boy, on top of the world, I feel like a million bucks, as it were. I don't get on the phone and say, Doc, I'm feeling great. I better come see you today. No, that's not the way it works. Those who are well have no need of a physician. Jesus implying from that, I am the physician. This is why I'm going to the tax collectors and sinners. And so we learn again about the power and the mission of Jesus Christ. He came to call sinners to the gospel. To those who thought they were right, even though they were full of uh, death and rot and decay, according to Jesus. In Matthew 23, Jesus said, I can't help you if you think you're right and you don't need me. But to those who know they need Christ, He's able to save to the uttermost. Those who come to God through Him because He ever lives to make intercession for them. Hebrews 7, verse 25 and 26. And so part of Jesus being the great physician requires me to realize I'm in need of that. I'm in need of His healing and His power. Then in Mark chapter 3, we learn further about that, that majesty, that power, and that deity of Christ because Jesus is here presented as the strong man, able to bind the devil. Look in Mark chapter 3. I want you to see what the scripture says about Christ in verse number 27. Jesus is talking about Satan and he says in verse number 27, No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man then he will plunder his house. And so Jesus is basically saying, I've cast out demons, which is part of Satan's entourage, because I'm stronger than him. Jesus has more power over Satan, and proof of that is when he cast out demons, he was plundering Satan, as it were. And so we here see the power of Christ over Satan. This is uh, so encouraging when we think about words like 1 John 4 verse 4. He who is in Christians, he is in you, is greater than he who is in the world. Christ is more powerful than the devil. He through death overcame him who had the power of death and released those who all their lifetime were subject to bondage. And so in Mark 3 we see the, the power of Christ over Satan and over this world. But friend, I want you to look in Mark chapter 4. And let's see another example of Christ's power. Uh, Jesus is now going to heal a man in Mark chapter 4 who had many problems, who was troubled by many things. Uh, he's going to heal some. But in Mark 4, he also calms the great uh, tumultuous sea of Galilee. And in calming that sea, I want you to look at what is said. Uh, look in Mark 3 verse 38 following. The disciples are greatly upset. Jesus is in the stern asleep on a pillow. They awoke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He arose, rebuked the wind and sea, said, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And watch this. And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea 
obey him. In the midst of the Sea of Galilee, in a little boat we might think of, the waves are beating and crashing in. It looks like there's great disaster coming their way. And where's Jesus asleep in the sea? He's not even worried about it. He gets up, rebukes the sea. He just says the words, peace be still. And that tumultuous Sea of Galilee becomes the Sea of Glass. And he looks at his disciples and he says, where's your faith in essence? And they are astonished beyond measure, saying, listen to these words, who is this? Who is this guy that even the wind and the sea obey him? Nobody has the power to say to a tumultuous, multiple thousand, if not million gallon lake, sea, be still and it becomes still. Who can do that? Nobody can. And then it says the lot, except God. And friend, that's the whole point. Jesus' power, His miracles, His ability, everything that He did, the healing, the casting out demons, the, the calming of the sea, the feeding of the 5,000, who could do those things except God? And that's the point of Mark. Mark stresses over and over and over again, the majesty, the deity, and the power of Jesus Christ. And friend, that's what we need to realize in our lives today. In a tumultuous, chaotic world that in many ways represents the, the Sea of Galilee and all the waves crashing around us, let's realize this. The anchor and the steadying point in this world the one who has the power to calm it and to help me see through it is the Lord Jesus Christ. How I need that, how we need that in our lives. If you've never obeyed Christ, friend, we want to encourage you to do that today. If you're not a Christian, you desperately need to become one. Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? John 8 verse 24. Would you turn from a life of sin? to the Lord in repentance, Luke 13, 3? Would you confess the beautiful name of Jesus before men, Romans 10, verse 10? And would you, like Christ, be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, Acts 2, verse 38? Friend, if you've not done that, we want to encourage you to do that. And if, as a Christian, sometimes you face these challenges, as we all do in our lives, let's remember, the more we look to Jesus, the more we focus on Him, and the more we let Him lead our life, the greater peace, joy, and happiness we'll have in that life. Join us next time as we're going to study more from the book of Mark together. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.